Um, so thanks for coming. Yeah, I've had a weird career. I've done a lot of different things, but today we're going to talk about the Python data bike shed. So hi, uh, I'm Rob. If you go to this link, uh, the slides are there. There's also a notebook that goes into a lot more detail. Um, I had a bunch of examples for all the libraries I'm going to talk about. It's all there, but it's sort of like too much to get into the presentation. Um, I am Ocean Kid Billy uh, on Twitter, and I just tweeted about this, so that's also a link to, to all the stuff. Uh, I work at Simple. If you're not familiar with Simple, simple.com, uh, we're a bank. And my, my pitch is like, we're a bank and we try not to be a terrible bank. Like a lot of people hate their bank. Uh, we try to be a bank that you don't hate. Uh, it's actually, it's a wonderful company. It's a wonderful place to work. I love the people that I work with. Uh, we have interesting data because we work with like sort of financial transactional data. Um, and we're hiring. Uh, caveat, we do a little bit of Python. Uh, we're mostly a JVM shop, so we write a lot of Scala, write some Clojure and that sort of thing. But we, we use Python as like the glue layer for a lot of, a lot of the stuff that we do. Uh, I like to start all of my presentations with, with sort of a question, like a foundational question for like why, why we're talking about anything is like, I have data. It's July 2015, so you're sitting down and uh, you want to answer some questions. So you want to group things or you want to count things or you want to average things or you want to add things. Uh, what library should I use? Um, the answer is it depends. It's like it's a cop-out, right? Uh, so it depends. It depends on the application. It depends on uh, what domain you're in. Um, it really depends on what you're trying to do and the size of your data and, uh, and, and like in your domain. Yep. So to enter the bike shed, right? So we are very lucky to have a PyData ecosystem um, where we have like sort of domain and applica application specific tools uh, and we have a very broad range of these, right? So th I'm, I'm going to make this analogy, right? So I'll make the analogy that Python data libraries um, are like bike. Right, so we can think about these tools uh, in terms of like analysis velocity and data locality. So how fast is my tool at doing a thing, um, and where is the data that it is operating on? So is it in memory? Is it on disk? Is it distributed somewhere? Um, all these libraries sort of address that uh, in different ways. So, uh, quick aside, well, maybe if you're here and you haven't used Python much, say, why should I use Python for data analytics anyway? Uh, so, while Python might not be the fastest language for things like web servers, and there have been a lot of benchmarks on that, it's extremely fast for high performance computing and numerics, uh, mostly because C, and maybe because Rust in the future, or C++, but because uh, we have a very fast layer um, that, can do, that can do numerics. So back to choosing our library and our bike analogy. Um, first, for some of these examples, we need a data set. So I, I've linked to this diamonds data set. Uh, this was actually aggregated by someone in the R community. That community is excellent at data set aggregation. They're actually way better than us uh, at like building packages around data sets, which is really useful, especially when like you're looking to do examples. Um, the R community's done a really nice job with, uh, with this sort of thing. So uh, this is actually a really familiar data set for a lot of people because it's used for a lot of examples. Uh, so this is the diamonds data set. So this is like each of these diamonds has a carrot and a cut color, clarity, depth, right? And it's nice because you have sort of a mix of categoricals and you have a mix of integers and, and floats. Um, so it's sort of a nice example data set to use for things. Uh, so let's start with like, my needs are simple. Uh, I don't like dependencies. I'm running an old version of Python. Uh, seriously, I don't want any dependencies. So standard library? Sure, why not? Like we can, we can use the standard library to do things, right? Uh, it, it's actually pretty batteries included. The problem being like you start doing things like, all right, well, stand, standard lib has a CSV importer, but I'm probably gonna have to roll my own type conversions, right? So it's like, all right, well, I can use the CSV importer that it has, but then I have to sort of check types myself. So, you know, that, that's like some cognitive load there. It's like, all right, well, now I have to build a type checker. You know, it'd be nice if someone else did that for me. Um, and then you're like, well, I want to group some stuff. So, all right, well, I guess I'm going to have to write my own grouping algorithm. And someone's probably written a better version than this. Um, but it works, right? You can, you can group things and just, and just straight, you know, C Python. It's fine. Um, you can, you know, you can do SQL-like stuff that's just, you know, pretty simple, straightforward Python logic. Uh, you know, you don't need a giant Hadoop cluster to, you know, to select a thing from a thing where another thing is greater than a number, right? Yeah, that's just that's just Python logic. Um, and then all these examples are in the notebook and, and work, and these are all things that you can do um, in Python, right? And C Python. So C Python's like your city bike, right? It's like reliable, it's familiar, maybe a little bit slow. Um, the velocity is a little slower. Locality, like you're working in memory, right? You're just working in, in, in plain Python. Um, so the standard library works, right? You can actually do a lot of very useful things in Python and people have been doing it for, you know, 30 years or whatever. Uh, but what if you have 10 million rows rather than 50,000 rows? Like, 
do you really want to spend your time writing aggregation code? Like surely someone else has done this before, right? Someone else has written aggregation code and it's probably very fast. Uh, are my functions composable, pure, lazily evaluated? If I write Python, do I care about those things? If you're Joel Cruz, you probably care a lot about those things, right? Um, what happens when my analysis gets more complicated or uses time or dates, right? Like none of those examples dealt with time and dates, which is one of the worst things to deal with when you're doing this type of analysis. Um, and then like, is you know when you import a CSV, it's like is a list of dictionaries the way that I want to work with tabular data? Um, and a lot of other languages like that is sort of like if you get results from a database, that's how you're working with the rows, right? You're working with like lists of maps essentially. Um, and so uh, the first question we'll answer is like, well, what if I like a functional approach to data analysis, right? I like my thing, you know, I like my functions to be purity and composable and all these functional things that people like to talk about. Uh, I like to think of things in terms of map, producer, and filtering. Uh, I like composing data pipelines and, you know, sort of streaming data through and, and Python has all this nice yield and yield from and generator stuff that is, that is lazily evaluated. Uh, so let's talk about the pools library. So uh, Tools was originally written by Matt Rocklin, uh, and basically it, it builds a bunch of nice functional operators on top of you know, CPython, right? So you can do functional things like, you know, I can map over a thing and then concatenate them all together into a final thing. Uh, it is lazy, so uh, it tries to use, like if it can use iter tools, it will use iter tools to do things, right? So, um, you know, you need take and then you need to like evaluate it and you need to call list on that to, eventually, to essentially uh, evaluate it. Um, you can do like SQL-like things, right? With tools, like, all right, I just, I just want counts. So uh, tools has like a frequencies thing where it's like, all right, I want counts of color. Uh, that's pretty straightforward to do. You have a little comprehension and then you say, I want frequencies. Um, even you get a more complex, right? I want counts of things from diamonds where price is greater than a thousand and I want to do some grouping. Um, the cool thing about functional programming is like there's a lot of ways to get at something, right? So this is an example where we're sort of piping a filter and then we're mapping across a thing and then we're counting things and then we're turning that into a dictionary at the end. So this is one way to look at that. This is another way to look at that, right? So we're like, all right, we can do a thread last where everything that we pipe in is gonna be the argument for the next thing. Um, and so we can do some filtering and counting through thread last, or we can just look at this as a reduction, right? So we can reduce across all the rows of this thing and we can answer this like this SQL query um, using a pretty straightforward reduction. Uh, so the first question, like of course, tools like functional programming, should it be a fixie? Um, well, maybe, but let's look at what tools actually does. So tools consumes iterables, dictionaries, functions, and it produces iterables, dictionaries, and functions, right? This is great because we're building on data structures that we already know and we're already familiar with. So tools is more like your bike tools, right? Because uh, it's, it's a little bit slower working in CPython. It can be a little bit faster because there's side tools in which someone came in and rewrote tools in Cython and passed the exact same test suite, which is actually a pretty cool thing to do. Uh, and it's pretty quick, but you're still working in local memory, so you're still sort of constrained by local memory things. Um, caveat being, we'll talk about Dask later, which you can use with tools, but we'll get there. So tools is great, um, but what if you don't like functional programming? Like, I don't understand any of this. I'm, I don't want to do mapping and reducing all this stuff. Like, I want to work with tabular data. Please just give me a tabular data interface. Uh, also, I have to work with time and dates. I'm incredibly sad because of this. Give me some way to work with these times and dates. Um, so before we get into the rest of the libraries, a very, very brief interlude. Uh, most of these libraries, or at least some of the libraries that we're gonna talk about, use all these things that I can only briefly touch on. And I like to think of these things as accelerators, right? So Cython is like this superset of Python in which you can call into C and make Python code very fast. Um, NumXPer is like a very fast expression evaluator for, uh, for NumPy. Numba is JIT compilation to LLVM. All of those things are sort of accelerating the code in a lot of the libraries we're gonna be talking about. Um, so they're essentially the gears, right? So they're the gears to our bike. They're what, they're what let us change gears and move faster within the libraries that we're using. Um, and then I, I don't explicitly have an example for NumPy, but like I can't not talk about it and talk about Python data libs, right? Because it's sort of like the foundation on which a lot of these things are built. Everything that I'm gonna talk about from here on out is either influenced by NumPy, is directly using NumPy, or has like NumPy helpers basically working within the library. Um, NumPy is still critical PyData infrastructure, um, absolutely. So so we had to talk about it, uh, it's gonna be used. So end of the interlude, NumPy is basically this, right? So NumPy is like one of the first bikes in the, in the Python ecosystem, essentially. Um, 
All right, so I have tabular data. I want data frames. I want like fast and intuitive exploratory analytics. I want a really fast CSV importer. Uh, I want to interface with SQL. I have time series data. Help me please, uh, pandas. All right, so a lot of you have, have, are familiar with pandas. It gets talked about a lot. I'm not gonna get too deep into the example. It's got a very fast CSV reader. You can do summary statistics, which is really nice for data exploration. Um, going back to SQL-like queries, uh, you know, select cut and the mean of price from diamonds and grouping by, that's all just like a one-liner in pandas, right? So going Going through these examples, you have to build like with the tool stuff, sort of like convoluted examples. With pandas, most of these are one-liners. You can do things very quickly, right? More complex query, um, same sort of thing. You know, you're doing you know fancy slicing, and then you're doing some grouping, and then you're doing a count. Uh, again, you know, another another pandas example where it's just like we can condense all of this logic down uh, into a single, into a nice single line of, of code. Uh, and then very quickly, the, one of the things like I love pandas for is, is dealing with dates, right? So uh, you can either pull in your own dates, you can generate your own date ranges, you have this concept of a date time index, uh, and then you can do nice things, right? So like, all right, well, uh, there, you know, I can I can do some resampling. So let's say I have you know data every minute. I want to resample to the day, and I want to mean all the points. Like I want to average all the points uh, in the resampling. So it has a really nice resampling. Let's say that I have missing data. So this is an example where like I have data on the 25th, the 30th, and the 5th. I'm like, all right, well, I need to fill in the blanks essentially, right? Um, so that's what this is. You can say I want to fill it forward, or I want to fill it backwards, or I just want to fill it with uh, with NA. Um, that is a thing you can do, and then you have a nice like contiguous set of dates. Um, so like I think of pandas as like the geared commuter bike, right? Daily use, a ton of features, it's faster, still working in local memory, but it's sort of like in day-to-day -day work, it's, it's the tool that I'm just gonna grab uh, to, do, to do a lot of my work. So uh, yeah, it's, it's like the geared commuter of, of, of libraries. Um, so pandas rocks, like I, I, love, I love pandas and our analysts use pandas every day. Uh, but there are some cases where uh, you have to think of data not just in a tabular way, right? That you need to think about uh, data in n dimensions. So you're thinking of data in cubes or, or even like higher dimension than cubes, right? So you're dealing with like multiple cubes or slices of data. Um, and you want to do fast numerics and your arrays are homogeneous. Uh, but what you don't want to do is give up on all of pandas like nice labeling and indexing features, right? Um, and then in-memory tables are bumming me out. So like this is one thing with pandas, like it's still working in memory and we'll get to like some of the things that we can use uh, to help us there. So we have n dimensions. Uh, we want to be able to aggregate that data in multiple dimensions. Uh, maybe you're working with NetCDF. Uh, maybe you have to deal with OpenDAV, which if you've ever done before is not necessarily a pleasant thing to do. Um, so we have this nice, this nice library, X-Ray. So this was built by Stefan Hoyer and, and some folks at Climate Corp. And the idea is uh, we can have all the indexing and labeling of pandas, but we can do it in multiple dimensions. So what I have here is like I have, I have a two-dimensional array. Um, I have some coordinates, so I'm essentially uh, naming, I'm essentially labeling the arrays here. Um, I create the x-ray data array, um, and that's essentially what this is, right? So I have x and y coordinates, and I have basically have labeled arrays uh, in two directions. And so you can aggregate, right, or you can do selections uh, based, based on like multiple dimensions, right? So I say I want I want the A and C labels. I want just those I want just those arrays from A and C. So that's what this is. Um, it's got uh, broadcasting, right? So I'd be like, all right, I want I want to broadcast across uh, the whole thing. Uh, it's just NumPy behind the scenes, so this is a thing that it can do, right? Um, but where it actually gets a lot more interesting is when you start thinking about not just like uh, so that was a 2D array, sort of like a table, um, but think about a cube of data. Right, where you've got an X and you've got a Y, but you've also got a Z direction, and you want to be able to sort of aggregate in any one of those directions, right? So this is essentially a data set, uh, an X-ray data set that's like a cube of data, right? So I have an X and a Y and a Z. So I have you want to think about as rows and columns, and then I have like time. So it tends to be you know aggregate data in time across the Z direction. So this is essentially a cube of data. Um, so you can do things like, all right, I'm gonna group in the X direction and I'm gonna sum. So if you go back and look at this data and you, and you pick out like the, the dimensions that we're summing on, you can sort of see how X-ray is aggregating this data across that dimension. So you can group in any dimension, any of the N dimensions you can group and then roll everything up. Um, so I like to think of like X-ray as like the BMX bike, right? It's a little specialized, but it's multidimensional. You can move in many different directions. It's faster. You're sort of still stuck in local memory, kind of, again, we have to get the DAS. Uh, which solves some of these problems for us. But X-Ray is awesome. Um, 
but so maybe we don't have an n-dimensional problem. Maybe we want to work with like pandas-like expressions across many data sources, right? So uh, this is actually a common case. Like I've got some data in CSVs, I've got some data in SQL, I've got some data in HDF5, I've got some data in some other data source. Um, I'm still running in-memory problems. Uh, but I have big data, maybe medium data, certainly maybe bigger, bigger than I can RAM data. Uh, and another thought is like, well, do my expressions, do, do these aggregations that I have need to be tied to my data structures necessarily? Can I build expressions that map across data structures uh, and storage? And the answer for that is yes, that's why we have Blaze. So um, think about Blaze as just sort of an expression engine that separates expression from computation. So this is basically saying, all right, Blaze, BZ Diamonds, I'm saying, you know, discover the schema of my data frame with the Diamonds data um, and turn that into a Blaze data source. And then uh, I'm like, okay, what type is this? This is, this is a Blaze expression, this is a symbol. Uh, and, I can, and I can do things like <clears throat> create these expressions. So this is like mean price. So this is answering some of the SQL queries that we were looking at before. Uh, so these are just Blaze expressions. They're not actually calculating anything. This is just pure expression. This is expressing how you want to aggregate the data, right? Um, and then you tell Blaze, all right, I want to commute, I want to compute this expression on this data uh, on this data source. So I have a data frame, I have an expression, and I want to compute these things. So we actually did this earlier. If you look at the examples, we already did this in Pandas. Now we're just using Blaze to do it. But like the real secret sauce is, I can say, okay, Blaze, here's a Postgres instance. I can use the auto piece of Blaze to say, take my data frame, dump that into Postgres, and then I can do the exact same computation against Postgres without changing the expression, right? And it's like a beautiful idea. So you're like, all right, I have this idea of how data is going to be aggregated. I build these expressions, and then I can do that against multiple data sources, whether or not it's a, it's a table that's in memory or some giant Hadoop cluster. It's the same expression mapped across different data sources. Um, and as you can see, like now instead of returning a data frame, it's returning a selectable. Um, and then I can tell Odo to say, all right, compute this against Postgres, put it back into a data frame, and I get the same answer, except it's used Postgres as the computation engine. Uh, this is a really powerful concept, right? Because now you can sort of work between in-memory representations to like I kind of out of core and distributed representations, but sort of like be able to work with the same core expressions. Um, so Blaze is like your mountain bike, right? It's like multi-speed, multi-terrain, because your velocity is really varied based on what you're using as your computation engine. And and your locality is also varied based on what your data source is. Uh, and like the idea of using expressions to do this thing is sort of beautiful because like you can map across these two things. Um, so yeah, please, great, this is awesome. Um, but what if you have lots of data and I'm finding that databases aren't fast enough, like maybe we can do something locally that's fast enough for me, but memory and disk space are sort of at a premium. Is there some way that I can compress my data and maybe kind of get fast analytics uh, out of like, you know, out of compressed data? Is there more that I can get out of my local machine? Uh, so, and assuming my data is homogeneous, uh, can I compress it in memory and on disk, but have that decompression be fast enough that I can actually perform useful analytics against it? Uh, and the answer for that is yes. That's why we have bcalls. Um, so bcalls is essentially a compressed data container. So when you, you can create a C table from a, a data frame, um, and this is what it looks like, and it gives you lots of scary looking data, right, on, on like how much storage you're using and like the compression ratios and that sort of thing. Um, and then if you, you know, you can actually take a look, like, all right, what are my compression ratios? Like how good is bcalls doing it, compressing my data. In this case, it depends on your types, right? Like some data types are more compressible um, than others. But you can do data frame-like things against bcalls, uh, either in memory or on disk. Um, and it's even the on-disk representation is, is extremely fast, right? Uh, so this is an example where I'm like, all right, I, what I just did, I'm gonna dump that whole thing to disk and I'm gonna do the same type of data frame operation, except I'm gonna pull it off of disk to do it. Uh, and this is essentially what bcalls is doing. So like bcalls will create uh, a directory and those like each one of those BLP files is your compressed data uh, on disk. And so um, this, is, this is sort of a nice thing too, right? And it's fast and there's some real advantages. It's kind of a specific thing, right? Because bcalls does not support the full API of pandas. Uh, it'll support some subset of those things. I think what we're gonna end up seeing is people building things on top of bcalls rather than seeing bcalls as like the environment in which you use it. But if you find yourself like really getting crunched and needing a compressed container, uh, it is a nice thing to use. And it actually is very fast. And it's like you're moving back and forth between memory and disk. Um, and I actually think bcalls is a pretty big deal. Like I, I think we're gonna see some things built on top of it. But being able 
to, uh, to perform aggregation on compressed data uh, is sort of huge for this like medium data analytics space where we need to be able to, we want to do some stuff locally, uh, but, but be able to use data on disk. Um, so finally, like what if we really want like parallel out of core computing, right? So uh, let's talk about Dask. Uh, we've, you know, you've probably heard, if you went to any of the sessions on Friday, uh, Matt Rockland gave a, a session on Dask. Um, it, this is like the, the line that enables parallel computing through task scheduling and blocked algorithms. So, um, so here's the recipe for all of your cores and or out of core computation. So we're gonna partition your arrays or your iterable, iterables or your data frames. Uh, we're gonna perform blocked algorithms on those. And this is sort of, a, this is a graspable idea, right? Like we're gonna take blocks of these things and, that, and we can parallelize those like in, in kind of embarrassingly parallel operations. Uh, so we're gonna perform parallel slash scheduled computations on the, those partitions. And then we're gonna put the pieces back together. Um, it sounds simple. Uh, kind of the secret sauce in what Dask is doing is how it actually schedules those things to make them efficient and make them run like sort of like vertically. If you see a Dask uh, graph, essentially it's like this huge graph of things and you want that graph to run most efficiently. Um, and sort of the secret in Dask is like, all right, we're gonna break up all these things and the blocking is relatively straightforward, but the scheduling is sort of tricky. And that's where Dask uh, has some really, really nice, nice stuff uh, and how it works. The other secret of Dask is that uh, the API looks like APIs that we're familiar with, right? So arrays are NumPy-like, right? So this, this looks like something that you would do with NumPy. Data frames are data frame-like. Uh, I was sort of like pleasantly surprised that I could drop in some relatively complex data frame expressions into here and just have it work. Um, that being said, there are some things that are sort of tricky to do in parallel. Things like sorts are hard because you end up doing shuffles. Not impossible, but kind of hard. And, and I think Matt Rockland's thing is like, if you need it, come and talk to me. If you use Dask and it breaks, come and talk to me and, and I'll try to get it to work, essentially. Um, and the same thing with sequences, right? So. Uh, so this is actually pretty cool. So I talked about tools earlier, and uh, and I said, well, you know, tools is, is based on like local memory and C Python sort of things. Um, but if you use a Dask sequence, then you can really use most. You can use tools against your Dask sequence, except now it's fully parallel. It's fully out of core, right? Um, and so this is also a beautiful thing, right? Like I, all I did was copy and paste this exact same thing from the tools demo earlier, except I dropped uh, a Dask. You know, he calls it a bag. I dropped a Dask sequence in there. And it totally worked and it was fully parallel uh, and, and I didn't really have to do anything. Um, so Dask is like our tandem, right? It's fast and it's parallel. Uh, velocity, is, it's quite quick. Um, locality, it sort of depends, right? It's in memory, it's out of core, they're working on the distributed features, uh, but it's great. Uh, it's, it's like one of the most promising, interesting, you know, Pi data libraries uh, that's out there. So what's left? I just flew through a bunch of things, and you're like, how can there be more? But we like we work in a very rich uh, ecosystem of tools. So um, one thing that I didn't talk about was Spark, the you know, fast and general purpose cluster computing system. We could do an entire presentation on Spark and, and PySpark. Uh, the original Spark interface was sort of the tool type things that we were seeing, right? So maps and reduces and flat maps and filters and that sort of thing. Except fully distributed, and you know, you do distributed computations, and if your nodes go down, Spark can be smart about how it rebuilds that pipeline of computation. Uh, to get to the, you know, to the final answer. Uh, Spark also has streaming and they have some machine learning libraries built on that. Um, so Spark is like this fast multi-person Surrey, right? Where it's like fast and parallel and distributed. Uh, the, the, the caveat there is like, this is where the analogy breaks down because the Surrey is not actually fast, but uh, locality is like in memory, on disk, distributed, like Spark is, uh, Spark is a very good library. One caveat is we're standing here at PyData talking about people who have Python um, in production and uh, Spark runs on the JVM, right? So Spark is all written in Scala. Uh, PySpark uses uh, pi for j to, to compile Python code into, into Java classes and is a little messy and the API always sort of lags behind uh, the main one. And, and the JVM is not, it's not a zero cost abstraction, right? Um, you can't assume, like, it, for smaller jobs, you can just sort of use PySpark and, and call Java and like spin up a job and it will work like locally. That'll work totally fine. But when you start to get like to bigger data and actually running a Spark cluster, like running the JVM uh, takes some work. Like you will have to have some infrastructure engineers, right, on your team spending at least a little bit of time tuning JVM params and keeping yourself from having like, you know, heap errors and that sort of thing and like tuning, you know, 
uh, garbage collection and all that sort of thing. Um, so like it, it is a thing that you have to think about. So uh, if you put Spark you know, in, in your stack, you know, you suddenly have a JVM stack, not just Python. So uh, that, is, that is something to keep in mind. So if in that regard, right, like Spark is sort of like a bike with square wheels um, and that like you can use Spark from Python, but uh, you also have to use it. Uh, you also have to like deal with the JVM. So, what about, there have been multiple distributed slash out of core ND array projects. Uh, Disarray, biggest Spartan, I'm not sure if any of those are actually like getting maintained and continued. Bolt is actually relatively new. So Bolt is an ND array that's backed by Spark. Um, and they're talking about whether or not they can back it by more, more data stores. Uh, and this is actually, this was announced earlier this week. My slides keep changing because things keep getting announced. Uh, but, but Bolt looks pretty interesting. So if you're interested in like a Spark backed ND array, you, know, you could take a look at that. Uh, it's a very crowded space, right? So people have been working on, uh, on like distributed array type of things uh, for quite a while. And there have been a number of implementations. Um, this actually wasn't a slide until this morning. So I went to, to Jay's talk, one of the co-founders of Datto's talk yesterday, uh, where he talked about S-Array and S-Frame, which is basically um, compressed on disk slash in-memory arrays and data frames. Uh, and it's very, very impressive, right? What they have built uh, is incredibly fast and scales to absolutely huge amounts of data. Uh, unless and unless you have like truly tremendous amounts of data, we're sort of getting to the point where you can do everything on your local machine, assuming your local machine has a pretty big hard disk. Um, we can do pretty fast like compression and decompression of data and, and pretty smart algorithms um, looking at pretty huge data sets, right? Like, oh, well, I mean, if you have, you know, terabytes of data, like, you know, that, that might even be tenable based on, you know, depending on the machine that you have. Um, I didn't know what kind of bike this should be, but their, uh, their logo has a dog. So this is a dog on a bike. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so quickly, let's talk about IBIS. Uh, so it's like Wes McKinney's, the original author of Pandas. This is his new project. Um, so we talked about Blaze, and Blaze is an expression system that we can map to different uh, compute, right? So uh, IBIS is the same sort of thing. It's a Pandas-like expression system that maps to Impala and Hadoop. Um, the idea being that some things are tedious and or difficult to do in SQL, uh, much less MapReduce, right? Like some, some ideas are difficult to do in SQL. Those ideas are really hard to do in MapReduce. Um, things like time series queries and correlated subqueries. And if you look at the, uh, the IBIS API, there's like five different types of joins. Some joins that aren't necessarily easy to do in SQL. Uh, and the idea is that like IBIS will create expressions and you can apply those expressions uh, via Impala and Hadoop. But uh, it'd be interesting if someone went in and like targeted IBIS at SQL, right? That's a thing that could be done. Um, you know, they've sort of abstracted away the expression engine and they can target that uh, at a different compute platform. Uh, so there is actually a bike brand called IBIS. So naturally, IBIS, uh, we have an IBIS bike on here. Um, stats and machine learning, right? So Cyclate Learn, uh, in my mind, like very clearly the benchmark for machine learning libraries, like both in API and documentation. If you've never read, this, read, uh, read the Scikit-Learn docs, it's probably the most amazing set of documentation you'll ever read. Uh, it is really tremendous. Uh, their API, they have put so much uh, careful thought into how they build APIs. Just really impressive effort in like how they build consistent APIs across their, their entire uh, library. And then stats models, the statistical models in Python built on our PyData toolbox. So all of these are sort of predictive analytics uh, things. We're gonna look into the future, so we have a bike from the future, right? So that, that's essentially what these things are. Um, and then finally, at the end of my abstract, uh, I said, what should, I told you that I tell you what you should paint the bike shed with. Uh, and the answer right now, like at, at this moment, probably is Seaborn, uh, which is a really nice visualization library built on top of Matplotlib, uh, and Bokeh, which is like just, plowing forward at amazing speed. Uh, and they have done, they have built some things in a bokeh that are actually very hard to do, right? Um, all the linked brushing and linked plots and like having servers that serve charts to, to JavaScript front ends and like being able to like map Python things to JavaScript things. Uh, all those things are very hard and like their team has done an amazing job. So if you're going to visualize something in Python, uh, I would recommend starting here because you can probably, uh, you can probably answer your question with one of those two libraries, at least in terms of like what chart, what, you know, can I make this chart? So that's it, that was a whirlwind, but uh, thank you. All right, I think 31 minutes. I think I have a couple minutes for questions. Yeah, no, all right. Oh, yep. Yeah. Do other languages have this, this large ecosystem of like many libraries sort of overlapping, but not quite, like R or? Uh, honestly, Honestly, no. I, I mean, so my familiarity with, I, I have less familiarity with R. 
uh, it seems like they're sort of just like focused on on the data frame and, and arrays and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but I, I I can't answer that question as well. In JVM world, the answer is no. The reason that Spark has gotten so much uptake is because the JVM was like not not good for numerics and doing these type of analytical things, right? Um, numerics and JV and, and like in the Java ecosystem are, are not great. Uh, certainly like nowhere even close to where the Python community has come in terms of like doing uh, numerical computation, which I why which is why I think like PyData is sort of like if you're doing like scientific things, why Python is sort of like you know the language that everybody's moving to. Um, and plus it's like a really pleasant language to work in. Uh, but in terms of like Java land, no, not really. Um, we we are we do sort of have a a wealth of riches in terms of like all the libraries and like uh, really relatively specific focus libraries uh, and, and, and what we do. So, any other questions? Um, so, yes, uh, I would say that, uh, so there's no, like, there's, there's no reason that we couldn't target Blaze at Hadoop, right? Um, so we could, you know, we, we could, we could point Blaze at a Hadoop cluster and, and let Blaze do its thing against, like, either Impala or, or directly against Hadoop itself. Um, I think the Dask project, uh, I think it'll read from HDFS, but Matt Rockland uh, can answer that question. Uh, I think that's going to be another project where, like, yes, eventually we can do distributed computation uh, with HDFS files and like work with Hadoop directly um, using Dask as like the computation layer. Um, so yes, I, I, I think like there are some things that we can do with with Hadoop now um, in Python, and like that's only going to get better over the next year. Uh, I'm actually really like having worked like purely in, in the JVM in the past year and like looking at all the like the Apache projects that are that are looking like working on top of Hadoop, um, I'm really positive on like where PyData is going for like actually solving sort of big data problems in production like at some scale. Um, things that like traditionally like Java has been used for. Um, like we'll be able to answer some of these questions with uh, or, or we'll be able to build some of these systems on Python and also we'll be able to interop, right? So like the Parsley folks have built uh, hooks into like Storm and Kafka that you can just use Python for those two things um, to move data. Um, and then like, we'll, I think we'll be able to use the Python layer to actually perform analysis on like, like true big data. Uh, and, and we're sort of like in this interesting place where we can also spin up huge boxes and like, uh, you know, kind of use serialization formats, um, non HDFS formats to do like also truly big data, like S frame and S array, right? Like have, have their own serialization format. Uh, they're very fast uh, for huge quantities of data. So, um, so yes, I think we will have tools that work on top of HDFS and Hoop. And I also think that we have tools that have their own like uh, secret sauce, you know, and in terms of how they store data that will also be just as fast and or faster than that. So any other questions? Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. So I sort of gave I gave a version of this talk, like a dry run of this talk, a couple months ago locally in Portland, and someone at the at the end basically said the same thing. He's like, has any has anybody written a blog post like actually doing this? And I said, well, no. There's this, right? There's the presentation like sitting on GitHub. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. Like someone should sit down um, and be honest about like, all right, based on your workload and your data size, like here's the library you should use, and, and here's why essentially. And if they're really motivated, uh, they could even put benchmarks, right? Like because uh, um, like Matt, I think you've done a really nice job of saying here's Dask, here's what it's good for, uh, here's what it's bad for, and like there are other libraries that will do this better. Um, you know, use my thing for what it's best at, essentially. So, any other questions? Yep. Yeah. 
Ooh, that's a good question. So I'd say one of my weak points is graph data. Um, I mean, I, I saw the, the data folks demo um, their graph stuff yesterday uh, and it, it like based on like their, the little bit that they talked about with how they're implementing it algorithmically, it looks like you know they've done some very smart things and made it very fast. Uh, I would probably start there, but I would say my graph knowledge is is not uh, is not as keen as maybe you know th these other things. So I would say start there and just you know do some googling because I'm not sure. So, all right, I think I think that's it. I think it's all the time we got. So thanks everybody.